Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I, I guess the first thing to say is thanks to Mary and the team for asking me to be here and uh, giving me this opportunity. The second thing I need to get off my chest is to say that uh, I've read the reports from New Zealand. And <laughs> they're, no, they're, I've read the reports. And based on what I've read, the unanimous opinion would be there wouldn't be a fair-minded Kiwi in the country who would not join with me in congratulating England on an extraordinary performance. I didn't see the game, but apparently an utterly riveting performance by the England team. The third thing to say is that I see this as a fantastic opportunity for me to connect with a group of people who are pivotal in shaping the thinking and behavior of a wide group of divers out there in the real world. And that is incredibly valuable for me, given the nature of the conversation that we're about to have. Now, you know, you know, many of you do know me as someone who is a fellow diver, a technical diver, but someone who studies diving medicine, physiology, technical aspects of diving, talks about that a lot, uh, sometimes on the internet, sometimes uh, with the idea of debunking bollocks, and I'd just like to uh, <laughs> tell Dr. Pollock that he is no doubt off Ross Hemingway's Christmas card list along with me now, so I feel like I'm in really good company. But um, the other thing that I do is I travel the world, and I feel very privileged to do this, doing what I am doing here today, and that is communicating some of these things that I'm very passionate about with my fellow divers. But although I usually speak about physiology and medicine of diving, the truth is, if I'm honest with you and honest with myself, I have to say that they are not the only things that are important, probably not the most important things for advancing the cause of safety in our sport. So what is? I've always been fascinated with the airline industry. The fact that they have taken an activity flying which was not particularly safe and have turned it into one of the safest things that humans can do, despite the fact that thousands of jets are in the air simultaneously all over the world, piloted by people who speak dozens of different languages, and yet it remains incredibly safe. How have they done that? Well, it's a variety of things, and it includes technical improvements in the planes themselves, but a big part of it, a huge part of it, is a suite of strategies that falls under the more general umbrella of what we would call human factors. Now, I don't talk about human factors very much, and that's because when I go to conferences, people want me to talk about physiology and medicine, and I frequently find myself at these conferences uh, in the presence of Gareth Locke, a British guy who many of you will know, who speaks very effectively about human factors, but he's not here today. And oh, that, wasn't, that wasn't supposed to be funny. If it came out funny, I didn't mean it to be. But I'm going to talk about human factors today because a huge part of my work that many of you never get to see is in that space researching the uh, means of improving outcomes for patients in the operating rooms when they're having surgery. Now, you might say, who the hell are you to be talking about human factors? You know, you're that physiology guy. But I do want to make that point strongly, that a big part of my research career is in this space. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, I, I'm an, an, an anaesthetist. Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, 
I'm an anaesthetist, and I'm going to drop into that, into that professional role for a few minutes to try and achieve two things. One, to convince you that I am active in this area, and two, to present to you a stunning example of how a really simple human factors intervention has markedly improved safety in a zone where you might not have expected it. So let's just say that any one of us develops pain in our right, the right lower region of our abdomen, and we go to a hospital and we're diagnosed with appendicitis. Your expectation would be that you would go to an operating room for surgery. Now, thankfully, due to anesthesia, operations don't look like this anymore. Uh, even in the NHS, uh, one, one <laughs> actually, I shouldn't have said that. Sorry, that was an inside world word. It came out. It came out. It came, they were inside words. The NHS is actually one of the, the wonders of the modern medical world, I have to say. Uh, it's an extraordinary system that copes incredibly well under a huge amount of stress. Just, I want to say that for my medical colleagues that are here. And we model a lot of what we do in New Zealand on the NHS. But no, it doesn't look like this anymore. You would come to an operating room where we all look like this, um, <laughs> and you would have your operation. <laughs> You would, you would have your operation. And, and the truth of it is that this is what operating theatres look more like. Uh, so this is me in one of our cardi the cardiac theatres where I work in New Zealand. That's Cecilia Roberts, who's a, uh, a diving physician from South Africa. But look, here we are in the modern world milieu of surgery and anaesthesia, to which we would all trust our lives in having an operation based on the very reasonable assumption that we would be cared for by highly trained professionals who aren't likely to make many errors. Well, I want you to hold that thought while I tell you the next part of the story. So about 13 or 14 years ago, Alan, Mary and I were site leads on a study that became quite famous, uh, published in the New England Journal in 2009. And in this study, we measured outcomes for patients before and after the introduction of a relatively simple checklist process into operating room practice. The checklist is actually used at three points during an operation with the sort of pivotal point being called the timeout. And just so that you've got your heads around what the checklist process looked like, I'm just going to show you a little video of a simulated, this is in our, in our operating room simulator, and, I, and you'll see I'm, I'm acting out of role here as a surgeon. I've been demoted from anaesthetist. <laughs> and, and this is a simulated timeout, just so that you can see what the surgical safety checklist was all about. So just watch this. Thank you. 
And then the patient could ask us to let you take a photo, take a photo, do whatever you want. Sure. So we need to be reminded about that material. Um, so Charlie, you can come up if you want. Sure. Thank you. Happy to go? Yes. So a process just before the scalpel is inserted for the first time that checks we've got the right patient, we're doing the right operation, that we all know each other by name, that a few procedural things have been done like giving the patient antibiotics, and that everyone's had a chance to express any concerns they might have about what we're about to embark on. So when we introduced this checklist process, two operating rooms at eight sites around the world, what do we show? Well, mortality, that is death, around the time of the operation or for 30 days afterwards, fell from 1.5% to 0.8%. And complications, a predefined set of complications, fell from 11% to 7%. Now, I hope you can see for yourselves that that is an absolutely stunning result. A halving, virtual halving of mortality and a something like 30% reduction in complications. In fact, the results were so good that many people all over the world just didn't believe it. It was just too good to be true. The study had to be flawed in, in some way and indeed, the methodology is somewhat weak and potentially confounded by a number of different things. However, in the subsequent years, a bunch of other studies emerged which all showed the same thing and confirmed the findings of the original study. And let me just take you back to that. In a, and let's be absolutely clear about the significance of this. In a human endeavour, that selects for the brightest people, I mean, obviously I made, made a bit of a cock up when I got in there, but anyway, selects for the brightest people and subjects them to the most rigorous training of any profession, the introduction of an incandescently simple human factors intervention, a checklist, resulted in these kind of improvements for patients. Now, in there, is a message for us. A group who indulges in a skills intensive, knowledge intensive, procedures intensive activity like diving, where it is highly likely that similar interventions could achieve similar results. Now there is a caveat to this, and that is that checklists to be useful have to be used properly. And they're not magic bullets. And indeed, we have run into problems with the surgical safety checklist. Poor practices emerged. Incomplete use emerged. And it wasn't uncommon for us to be seeing the sort of thing that I'll, just, that I'll illustrate with this video. So compare this to the one that you just saw. Okay, so we've got Matthew Theron, who's here for a left knee arthroscopy. Are you here with that? Everyone okay with that? Okay, we need to get on with this. Too much kumbaya going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, kind of hoping for a golden globe for that, or, you know, like some kind of Oscar anyway for being like a very realistic orthopaedic surgeon. <laughs> no disrespect to any orthopaedic surgical colleagues that happen to be in here. But no, we were seeing these problems, and so we have spent the last 10 years trying to optimize checklist, checklist practices using various strategies, like putting the checklist on the wall, taking it, the responsibility for leading it away from just the scrub nurse, having the anaesthetist leading one phase, the surgeon leading the phase that you just saw. So they can't behave like that. Strategies of that nature 
which we published a couple of years ago and which have now pervaded their way around the world. And I tell you these things not so much to, you know, to kind of brag about it, but more to say that this is an issue that I am deeply engaged in. And I do believe, I genuinely believe, it has a lot of potential to cross-pollinate into diving. So let's bring the conversation back to diving. So in human factors, we have two relevant terms that I want to introduce. First of all, we refer to mistakes as errors, and we refer to bad choices or decisions as violations. And you've heard several times today, in both the presentation by Neil and by Claire, that bad choices by divers, what we refer to as violations, are a common cause of diving accidents. Now, I'm not saying that all adverse diving events are caused by errors or violations, or indeed that all errors or violations will lead to adverse, adverse diving events, but where those two areas intersect, we have events that are almost certainly preventable. And so what I want to do now is move on and talk about violations and errors in diving and how we may go about reducing them. And we'll start with violation. Now, let's be clear about what we're talking about. A violation is when you knowingly or we knowingly create or increase the risk of an adverse outcome. So clearly there's an element of choice here. You know you're doing something that's not optimal, but you still do it. And obviously, when you do this, you expect to get away with it. And look, we all commit violations. A great example is in this photograph. There's no one in this room who has not crossed a road at a place 20 meters away from another place where they could have crossed the road more safely, or at a more egregious level, maybe going through a traffic light a little bit late when it's about to turn red. These are violations. A more maritime example is this ship. I wouldn't expect too many people in this audience to be familiar with it, but this is a Russian cruise liner. Well done. Is that Michael Rowley? No? Oh, okay. I, see. I can see a beard, so I just assumed. I, um, it is the Mikhail Lermontov. Well done. So in 1986, this Russian cruise liner was on a cruise out of Sydney around New Zealand. And... One of the places she had to transit past was this cape. Now, there's lots of sort of marine uh, expert type people in this room. You will know that when there is a cape with a lighthouse not far off it, generally that means you're supposed to go around the lighthouse, not between the cape and the lighthouse. And indeed, you can see with a bit of current flowing here that there are some obvious underwater obstructions not far from the surface but for some reason best known only to him and probably the extensive amount of vodka that the Russians were feeding him at the time, a New Zealand pilot took the ship between the Cape and the lighthouse. Unbelievable. And she hit a rock, well-known rock, called Palom Rock. It was a Titanic-like situation in that it tore a long strip, a, lo you know, a long gash along the side of the ship she drifted up into this sheltered and closed port and sank in about 40 meters of water, creating a fabulous wreck diving site. And indeed, um, <laughs> widely regarded as New Zealand's worst ever maritime disaster because all 600 Australians on board were saved. <laughs> um, but, but um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if there's any Aussies in the audience. But, the point of the story is that this was a classic violation. That pilot knew that that ship, maybe it could fit through there if he got it exactly right, but there was a big risk in doing it, and the risk didn't come off, even though he probably expected to get away with it. What about something even closer to diving? I'm going to tell you now about a rebreather accident that we know quite a lot about. So, a highly experienced... How many rebreather divers in the audience, by the way? Quite a few. Okay, so this will really strike home for, for, for you. But 
I'll try and explain the, the relevant terminology and technical um, details of it for the rest of you to be able to understand it as well. So this was a highly experienced guy. In fact, an instructor who had two students on a, an advanced rebreather diving course. I'm not quite sure what stage of training it was, but these were all certified rebreather divers, but two students undergoing a higher level training. They were doing a 59 meter dive, and the instructor had a seizure, uh, an oxygen seizure, and became unconscious after 27 minutes. He was rescued to the surface by his two students, but he didn't survive, and both of the students ended up in our hyperbaric unit. Subsequently, an examination of the rebreather showed that there had been a simultaneous failure in two of the three oxygen cells that read the pressure of oxygen in the breathing gas. And those two cells were both three years old. Now, right there, you have a major violation. All rebreather divers, let alone instructors, know that you, these cells fail over time, and we never leave them in our units for longer than 18 months max. A lot of people change them after a year. And this is critical because it, the cell's output is how the rebreather knows how much oxygen is in the breathing gas. And if, the, if one cell starts to drift away from the other two by you know, more than a threshold amount, then what the rebreather does is it ignores that one cell that's drifting away and averages the value of the two that are still close together. But that's a big problem if the two that are close together are actually the cells that are failing, because then the rebreathing will, rebreather will be driving the level of oxygen in the unit based on entirely wrong information. Now, the good thing about the rebreather that this guy was using, it was one of Martin's units. It has, I would argue, the best black box capability of all the rebreathers. And so we were able to see pretty much exactly what happened here. So um, just I've, I've labelled it so that I hope you can follow me through just from the descriptions. But on the left-hand vertical axis is depth. Then the, the horizontal axis is time. And the right-hand vertical axis is the pressure of oxygen in the rebreather loop. And if you follow the depth line, that black line labelled depth, you can see it took them a while to get down to 60 metres. It took about 12 minutes. Then they're down there for a period of time and they start to surface. And the diver had his seizure probably somewhere quite close to the right-hand side of the graph just before that rapid ascent. Now, the other thing to look at is that the reading of the three cells are those vertical wavy lines that sort of start where you see that number 1.3 there. 1.3 is the pressure of oxygen in atmospheres that the diver had told the rebreather that he wanted to breathe. And you can see at the start, the cells are all quite close together and the rebreather sorts out the PO2 and it's sitting around 1.3, which is that horizontal line. And then you can see that the line for cell three starts to drift away, starts to drift up high, and the other two cells remain lower. What's happening here is cells one and two are failing, and, the, and cell three is drifting apart from them, so it gets ignored. The rebreather is now adding oxygen to try and achieve an average value of 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen between cells one and two. The trouble is they're failing at a level just below where they can actually read 1.3 atmospheres of oxygen. So the rebreather's adding more oxygen and adding oxygen, try and get the level up to 1.3, but it can't. The real PO2 is what cell three is reading. And by the time it stops actually reading at 2.5 atmospheres, that's about as high as it goes. But by the time he had his seizure, he was probably breathing about four atmospheres of oxygen underwater. Now, from quite early on in the piece, you see those double orange lines there? The rebreather was giving the diver cell warnings. So alarms that said, you have problems with your cells. They're not reading the same. 
And there are procedures that rebreather divers can use to figure out what cells telling the truth. But he didn't do that. And indeed, what he did was manually suppress the alarms. So those little yellow tick marks that I've indicated there are actually places where he pushed a button, intentionally pushed a button, to tell the rebreather to stop alarming. Even though he could see for himself that one of his cells is drifting way high and that something is clearly wrong. And then 27 minutes into the dive, he had a seizure and did not survive. Extraordinary. Now, out of all that, I want to reinforce this idea that a violation doesn't arise out of incompetence. There's no way he did not know what he was doing. This was a conscious decision not to follow the procedures that he knew he should be following. So the practice deficits that led to his death were choices that he knew were not optimal. And I would guarantee you that there's a lot of people here in this audience who are sitting there thinking, yeah, okay, but I would never have done that. I wouldn't do that. And for those of you who've convinced yourselves of that, let me put this question to you. If that diver were here now, let's just say it wasn't him, it was someone else. If that diver were here in this audience, participating in this discussion, do you think he would endorse ignoring repeated cell warnings while one cell indicated that he might have catastrophic hyperoxia? Do you think he would say, oh, yeah, that was okay, I would do that. Of course not. He would say exactly what you're saying. Oh, I would never do that. That's stupid. I would never do it. And yet he did. So why did he do this during the dive? And I think that this is something that many of us, if we're honest with each other or ourselves, we will recognize that we have come close to doing or have done, maybe not exactly those kind of circumstances, but things along these lines. And I refer to it as corrupted motivation. It's like that in the heat of the moment, during a dive, divers will prioritize things like not being the one to hold people up, not being the one to thumb the dive and say, I'm, you know, something's wrong, I'm not happy, we need to stop, not admitting that there's something wrong with my rebreather, Ahead, you'll prioritize those things ahead of ensuring your own safety. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, and I have caught myself doing it. I have been in a situation like that where something on my rebreather has failed, and I thought, oh, no, look, I'll just carry on because I've got alternative ways of monitoring this. And you have to go, no, that's just madness. You've got to stop doing it. But there is a thing that kind of pushes you to do that. You don't want to be the one to admit some kind of problem. And so far I've been talking about fairly technical things, but here is an example of a, a classic violation that occurs on scuba air all the time, and I'll bet there's lots of people in the room who've seen this or done it themselves. So a classic tropical dive, uh, 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 an escorted scuba dive activity where a dive master tells all the divers to notify them on their scuba tour at half pressure in their tank. And what happens, a diver's ashamed of using their air too fast, doesn't want to be the first one to go, I'm down to half a tank, so doesn't notify the dive master and runs out of air late in the dive. That, I bet you, there are people in this audience who have seen that happen and maybe even have been guilty of not notifying when they were supposed to. Now, there are factors that encourage violations, like time pressure, like shortages of things, costs of things, and misplaced beliefs, like in that last scenario where oh, if I use my air too fast, that must mean I'm a crap diver and I don't want to admit to that. And so at least some of the ways we avoid violations must address those issues. But I'll just show you one more example that gets to the time pressure thing. So this is another one that I have seen. 
a diver that usually adopts a very long decompression protocol, a, a conservative decompression protocol. Neil talked about this this morning, using gradient factors that give you long, shallow stops. I do this. If I've got gas, I like to do long decompressions. But then there's time pressure from the boat skipper. The diver cuts their decompression short and suffers decompression sickness. A, a classic violation, but one that's kind of mitigated by the fact that there were external influences pushing the diver to do it. So if we're going to prevent this, then there's a bunch of things that we might be able to address that will help. Like having systems that don't create those external pressures, like not having shortages of things, making sure there's lots of oxygen available, making sure that there's lots of CO2 absorbent available when you're using rebreathers, making sure that we don't put undue time pressure on people. But probably the second two things are the most important. We need, and this is where I'm appealing to you as industry leaders, we need a culture where it is respected to make safe decisions. That making safe decisions, as inconvenient as it may be at the time, is actually seen in a very positive light. Not as a weakness, not as, oh, you're letting the side down, but as, wow, you should be respected for making that decision because that was the safe thing to do. And also developing within ourselves that cognitive discipline that allows us to resist the temptation to do something we know is wrong and that we shouldn't do but for some reason we're tempted to do when we're underwater and something's not quite right. And I can't emphasize enough the crucial role that you play as senior divers in role modeling, mentoring, training people to develop these attitudes. Imagine the beneficial experience those trainees would have had on that rebreather dive if their instructor had gone, when they got to the bottom, oh, I've got a cell warning, and done the right things like a diluent flush to figure out which cells were telling the truth and then calling the dive when it was apparent things weren't right. Imagine how positively that would have affected them as an example for their own futures. And instead, they watched their instructor die and got decompression sickness themselves and trying to rescue him. What an opportunity missed. So that is violations. I now want to go on and talk a little bit about error, but look, um, uh, in some ways this is not my typical presentation because, you know, I usually, you know, when you're talking about serious stuff like this, I, I tend not to throw too much humour into it, but I, I must say I, I need to break this up a tiny bit so that you don't all fall asleep and that you actually appreciate the importance of what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to tell you one little thing that I was reminded of this morning, um, in relation to my earlier naval career and a conversation with one of you, also watching Jen talk about the, the Royal Oak. Um, uh, many of you might know that I was a naval medical officer for 10 years. I got to deploy all around the world on Navy ships and had a marvelous time doing that. One of the things that you uh, come to appreciate in the military, I think any one of the forces, is the extraordinarily good sense of humor that many military people have, including your commanding officers. And I, I was reminded in this conversation I was having this morning about how it was an accepted art form in the military for commanding officers to re write creative and oftentimes somewhat humorous reports about their officers. So genuine report, two, one, two reports from the New Zealand Navy and one from the Royal Navy. And uh, so, so in one report, I remember a commanding officer saying, this officer is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. <laughs> and on another one, this, this officer sets low standards for himself and consistently fails to meet them. <laughs> Which I, I thought that had a certain degree of brilliance about it. And then the best one was, and I, and I actually wanted to point out that this was Royal Navy because I was in the New Zealand Navy, just so you know it wasn't me. This medical officer has used my ship to carry his genitals from port to port, and my officers to carry him from bar to bar. I, that was absolutely stunning. I, okay, so we've talked about violation, and actually violation is the hardest one, because it's, 
it's a, it's, a, it's a cognitive thing. We've got to teach ourselves a discipline. Errors are actually slightly easier in many respects. So an error is when you're trying to do the right thing, you think you're doing the right thing, but you actually do the wrong thing. It's like a mistake. It's not a choice to do something wrong, but it's a mistake. And it is important to acknowledge that we all make errors. All of us, and, and you know, numerous philosophers in the, in the human factor space have opined on this. We all make errors. And in diving, there are lots of potentially catastrophic errors. And I'm not going to read this out, but you know, plenty of them relate to rebreathers, but there's lots of them that uh, relate to just simple, basic open circuit scuba diving. Lots of potential for errors that can result in catastrophe. So how do we go about preventing them? Well, there are fundamentally two streams of strategy that one can take, and I'm only going to talk about one of them. There are many people, and some in this audience, I don't know if Martin's here, but this is something that he's paid a lot of attention to over the years, the opportunities for engineering out the probability of making an error. You can never completely do that, but you can certainly help. So you can make things so that you can't connect the wrong thing to the wrong thing by engineering solutions. But human factors is a big part of this. And training, having protocols to do things in the same way every time, teamwork and communication, and then this thing I refer to as cognitive aids. And this brings me back to my previous discussion about checklists. Now, this is a photograph of me in a the cockpit of an A380, uh, and I, I will tell you how I came to be there a little bit later. But the thing I just wanted to highlight in this cockpit is in that central control there, there's that panel that looks like this, and I know you can't read it, but it's a checklist. And its heading is before takeoff. So they have electronic checklists that pop up and the pilot and the co-pilot will go through them together. Now there's a couple of things about that checklist I want you to note. Taking off in an A380 is a complex process, but that checklist only contains a relatively small number of points that are what one might call killer items. Things that if they're not done are likely to result in the plane crashing. So they are the things that the pilots must not forget to do. It's not a comprehensive manual that tells the pilot how to take off in an A380. That would be a waste of time. The pilots are already trained to do that. These are the things that they must not forget. And that segues quite nicely into what I refer to as the barriers to implementing checklist use in diving. So there is a fundamental, often there is a fundamental misunderstanding about the purposes of checklists. You might turn up on a boat and you'll see a rebreather diver that has four pages from the rebreather manual that tells you how to assemble the rebreather and they'll say, oh, this is my, I've bought a checklist. That's not a checklist. That is a instruction manual segment, if you will. That is not what I am talking about when I speak of checklists. And then you see people say, well, you know, checklists kind of get in the road, they're inconvenient, they delay you. And an example of how you mitigate both of those concerns is you put a very concise killer item point checklist somewhere where you don't have to carry it, where you can find it easily. And this is a laminated checklist for assembly and preparation of my inspo rebreather on the inside of the lid that I can see easily. Another example, and if I could wave a magic wand and make all rebreather divers do this, I would wave that wand without his, not this, what I'm about to show you, I would wave that wand without hesitation, and that is what I'm referring to as a pre-jump check and response checklist for rebreathers. I said before, killer items. So many rebreather divers have died because they jump in with the rebreather switched off, with the oxygen cylinder switched off, 
with the diluent cylinder switched off or empty or with their dry suit not connected. Four killer items. Now I have a checklist that I use all the time when I go diving and I hand it to the dive master. It doesn't even have to be someone who knows that much about rebreathers. And on this occasion, many of you will recognize this diver. It's Mark Powell, very well known British diver. He'd never seen this before and we just did it together with me reading it off. I'd written it out on a piece of paper, what I normally use. We videoed it on an iPhone, there was no practice and you can see how smoothly and easily it goes. Four killer items that have been responsible for the deaths of multiple rebreather divers, and that checklist took 45 seconds. It's not a huge imposition in time at all. Now, another barrier is that people will sometimes say, oh, well, four items, right? I can do that from memory. Maybe, but sometimes they don't. So having it as a physical list and an event makes you do it. And I don't make mistakes. Well, that's true until you do. And for people who believe that kind of philosophy, I take you back to this. The change in outcomes for patients cared for highly by highly trained professionals who instituted a checklist and achieved these extraordinary gains in patient outcome. All of those clinicians would say, I can do this from memory, I don't make mistakes, and yet the evidence says something about that process you're going through is improving the outcomes for these patients. And I believe it makes a very compelling argument for using checklists. Now there's actually evidence from diving, and this for the open circuit scuba air divers amongst you is from that kind of diving. And I actually don't know why Dan hasn't made more of this, published in a very prestigious journal, a study done by the Dan Group about five years ago. So a thousand, just over a thousand scuba air divers randomized to use a checklist or not prior to diving for two, just over 2,000 dives a properly randomized study. Now, I don't particularly like their checklist. It's quite a long-winded thing. There's quite a few items on it, and I think it could probably be refined, but I can't argue with the result. And I'm not gonna read that out, but just to point out that it's got things like, you know, checking your tanks, checking your, your equipment, formulating a dive plan and discussing it and establishing procedures, those kind of things. Things you would expect to find on a checklist. Anyway, what did they show? Major mishaps on the dives where the checklist was used were reduced by 36%, and minor mishaps by 32%. But major mishaps, what do they mean by that? Rapid ascent, slow out of air situations, entrapment, buddy breathing, lost buddies, regulator malfunctions, those kind of things. Stunning evidence that a checklist used properly before diving works. A few years ago, uh, Alan Mary and myself, who were part of that original WHO checklist study, were asked to write an editorial on these matters. And we made a couple of points that I'll just sort of iterate to you because I think they're directly translatable to diving. So a doctor shouldn't give a drug without checking whether the patient's allergic to it. A doctor shouldn't see a patient with a fever without remembering to ask if they've been overseas in some tropical country recently. And we acknowledge that there shouldn't be any need to, to teach doctors these things because they already know it. 
but there may be a need to make sure they just don't simply forget to do it. We all make mistakes. And you can take that editorial and just change patient safety to diving safety and change the, the text of it saying that no rebreather diver should enter the water without checking their oxygen's on, the diluent's on, the rebreather's switched on, etc. There should be no, we acknowledge there's no need to teach rebreather divers these things. They're already taught it, but there may be a need to just make sure they don't forget it. So I think that it should be possible to convince divers that using checklists is a sign of strength not weakness, which is how some of us naturally respond to the idea that we may need a cognitive aid. It's a strength that you choose to do that. And the inspiration for that comes from time after time it's been proven to work in aviation. So the reason I was sitting in that A380 cockpit is I have a friendship with this guy, a guy called Richard de Krebny. He's an Australian uh, Qantas pilot, A380 pilot, and he became quite famous when, uh, it's about eight or nine years ago now, he was flying an A380 out of Singapore and the port inboard engine exploded. Now, and that's the engine after the event. Now, the, the, the explosion, well, the loss of the engine per se was not the biggest problem. The problem was all the damage that the shrapnel did to the control systems in this fly-by-wire aircraft. There was one engine he couldn't control at all, and there was a whole lot of avionic stuff that he couldn't control. In other words, the plane became almost unflyable. I mean, what, losing one engine's no big deal. It's all the other stuff that went on. And he managed to fly that plane, land it back in Singapore safely, saved all the passengers on board, which, of course, puts him in quite rarefied company. The guy on the left, of course, is Chesley Sullenberger, who landed an A320 on the Hudson River and saved everyone on board. Uh, now, both of these gentlemen, I actually don't know Sullenberger, but I know Richard pretty well. They used checklists during these crises. Sullenberger didn't have a lot of time, but Richard de Krepney used the crisis checklists on the A380 extensively to make sure he was not forgetting any critical steps in the heat of the moment. And he is absolutely clear that pilots see the use of checklists as making them better pilots. Not worse pilots, not weak pilots, not pilots whose memories don't serve them well, but the use of checklists makes them better pilots. And I believe we should be able to convince our divers, particularly our rebreather divers, of exactly the same thing. Thank you very much.